Did Jesus of Nazareth rise from the dead? Please welcome with me Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Robert Price. Dr. William Lane Craig received his Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Birmingham, England, and his Ph.D. in theology from the University of Munich, Germany, where he was a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, studying the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll begin with Dr. Craig for 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. Let me begin by expressing my gratitude to the Veritas Forum for the invitation to discuss this important question tonight with Robert Price. Now, in our discussion this evening, I'm not going to treat the New Testament as a wholly inspired and therefore infallible book, but rather simply as a collection of ordinary Greek documents coming down out of the first century. I'm not interested, therefore, in defending the inerrancy of the Gospels. Rather, we're interested in determining what facts they do credibly establish concerning Jesus' fate and what is the best explanation of those facts. Accordingly, in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. Number one, the New Testament documents establish four facts concerning Jesus' fate, his honorable burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And number two, the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. So let's look at that first contention together. I'm going to share with you four facts which are widely accepted by New Testament historians today. It's worth emphasizing that I'm not talking just about conservative scholars, but about the broad mainstream of New Testament scholarship. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. This fact is highly significant because it means the location of Jesus' grave was known. As Dr. Price himself admits, it's hard to imagine that the disciples could have believed in Jesus' resurrection, much less persuaded others, if the occupied tomb of Jesus had stood there refuting them by its very presence. And New Testament scholars have established the fact of Jesus' honorable burial on the basis of evidence such as the following. Number one, Jesus' burial is attested in the very old information handed on by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. Can I have the overhead, please? Um, good. In this chapter, Paul uh, says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then comes this formula, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. This old information has been dated to within five years after Jesus' crucifixion. The second line of this saying refers to Jesus' burial. Uh, comparison of this four-line formula to the gospel narratives on the one hand and to the apostles' sermons in the book of Acts on the other hand reveals that this second line is a summary of the burial story of uh, Jesus in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. Thank you. Number two, the burial story is part of the very old source material used by Mark in writing his gospel. Since Mark is the earliest of the gospels, his source material goes even closer back to the events of Jesus' life. And thus we have very early independent attestation of the burial in both Mark and Paul. Three, as a member of the Jewish high court that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. There was an understandable hostility in the early church toward the Jewish leaders who in Christian eyes had engineered a judicial murder of Jesus. And thus, according to the late New Testament scholar Raymond Brown, Jesus' honorable burial by Joseph is very probable since a Christian fictional creation of a Jewish Sanhedrist who does what is right for Jesus is, and I quote, almost inexplicable. Four, 
The burial story lacks any signs of legendary development. Even Rudolf Boltmann, one of the most skeptical scholars of this century, declared, this is an historical account which creates no impression of being a legend apart from the women witnesses. The eminent scholar of the Book of Mark, Vincent Taylor, says that even Boltmann's assessment is a notable understatement. The narrative belongs to the best tradition. And number five, no other competing burial story exists. If the story of Jesus' burial were a legendary fiction which arose much later than the original event, then it's strange that we have no traces at all of the original account or even of competing legendary stories. The unanimity of the burial traditions speaks in favor of the reliability of the gospel account. For these and other reasons, the majority of New Testament's critics concur that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Fact number two. On the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Among the reasons which have led most scholars to this conclusion are the following. Number one, the old information transmitted by Paul implies the empty tomb. Overhead, please. It does so in two ways. First, the expression, he was raised, following the expression, he was buried, implies an empty tomb. Uh, a first century Jew could not have thought otherwise. That reference is being made here to Jesus' empty tomb is again evident by comparing this four-line summary with the gospel uh, accounts of the resurrection. And you discover that the third line corresponds to the empty tomb narrative. Second, the expression on the third day is probably a uh, time indicator for the women's discovery of the empty tomb. Very briefly summarized, the question here is how the resurrection came to be dated on the third day. Why not the seventh day or the tenth day? Well, the most probable answer is that it was on the third day after the crucifixion, according to Jewish reckoning, that the women discovered the tomb empty. And so naturally, the resurrection came to be dated on that day. And thus, in Paul's information, we have two extremely early indications of the fact of the empty tomb. Thank you. Two, the empty tomb story is also part of Mark's very old source material. Mark's source did not end with Jesus' burial, but with the empty tomb narrative, which is tied to the burial account by verbal and uh, grammatical similarities. And thus again, we have very early independent attestation of the fact of the empty tomb. Three, the story is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. In Mark's account, the women come to the tomb early Sunday morning and find the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. They see an angelic figure who proclaims to them that Jesus is risen and will appear to them in Galilee. They flee from the tomb in terror and silence. Now, to appreciate the simplicity of this account, one has only to compare it to the accounts in the forged apocryphal Gospels of the second century and beyond. For example, in the so-called Gospel of Peter, the tomb is encompassed by a Roman guard, all the Jewish chief priests and Pharisees, as well as a huge crowd from the surrounding countryside. Suddenly, during the night, a voice rings out from heaven, and the stone over the tomb rolls back by itself from the door. Then two angels descend out of heaven and enter into the tomb. Then Jesus himself comes out of the tomb, upheld by the two angels. The heads of the two angels reach up to the clouds, but the head of Jesus overpasses the clouds. Then a cross comes out of the tomb, and a voice from heaven asks, Hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, Yay! Now, this is how real legends look. They're colored by all sorts of apologetical and theological motifs. 
uh, which are conspicuously missing from the account in the book of Mark. At the very most, we would only want to excise from Mark's account the angelic figure as an embellishment, and what remains is stark in its simplicity. Four, the tomb was probably discovered empty by women. In Jewish society, the testimony of women was regarded as so unreliable that they were not even permitted to serve as legal witnesses in a Jewish court of law. Now, in light of this fact, how remarkable it is that it is women who are the discoverers of Jesus' empty tomb. Any later legendary account would certainly have made male disciples like Peter and John to discover the empty tomb. The fact that it is women rather than men who are the chief witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb is best explained by the fact that they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what, for them, was a rather awkward and embarrassing fact. And number five, the earliest Jewish response presupposes the empty tomb. In Matthew 28, we find the earliest Jewish response to the disciples' proclamation of the resurrection. What were Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation, he is risen from the dead? That these men were full of new wine? That his body still lay in the tomb out on the hillside? No. They were saying the disciples came and stole away his body. Now think about that for a second. The disciples came and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the proclamation of the resurrection was itself an attempt to explain why the body was missing. And thus we have evidence for the empty tomb from the very opponents of the early Christian movement. I could go on, but I think that enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist on the resurrection, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Fact number three. On multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. This is a fact which is virtually universally acknowledged by New Testament scholars today for the following reason. Overhead, please. Number one, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances, which is quoted by Paul, guarantees that such appearances occurred. Paul goes on to say, then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Given the early date of this information, as well as Paul's personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances can't be dismissed as legendary, but must refer to actual events. Thank you. Number two, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. For example, the appearance to Peter is attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is attested by Luke, John, and Paul. The appearance to the women is attested by Matthew and John. The appearances in Galilee are attested by Mark, Matthew, and John. The appearance narratives span such a broad uh, spectrum <clears throat> of independent sources <clears throat> that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences, even if it's impossible to prove the historicity of any particular appearance story. Even the skeptical German New Testament critic Gaut Ludemann therefore concludes it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four. The original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation that confronted the disciples following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jewish messianic expectations had no idea of a Messiah 
who, instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies, would be shamefully executed as a criminal. Two, according to Old Testament law, Jesus' execution exposed him as a heretic, a man literally accursed by God. Three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar at Emory University, states some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty grave behind him. In summary, then, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of scholars. Jesus' burial by Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. And thus, the majority of scholars would agree with my first contention. Dr. Price, however, does not. He denies all four of these facts. But that would be putting it too mildly, for he doesn't deny merely these four facts. He denies that Jesus of Nazareth ever really existed at all. He writes, It is quite likely that the central figure of the gospel is not based on any historical individual. If you could travel through time back to first century Nazareth, you would not find a Jesus living there. Now, no New Testament historian or scholar believes such a thing. Even radical critics on the left wing of New Testament scholarship recognize that Jesus was a real historical individual who suffered execution by crucifixion during the administration of Pontius Pilate. We've seen that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul transmits information concerning Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection appearances. In order to avert the force of this evidence, Dr. Price is driven to claiming that this passage was not originally part of Paul's letter, but was inserted much later by a copyist. No one believes such a thing. The whole of New Testament scholarship, whether liberal, moderate, or conservative, disagrees with this view. They are so far left, they're off the radar screen. By contrast, the case that I've presented tonight would be agreed to not just by conservatives, but by the majority of New Testament scholars today. But that leads to my second basic contention, that the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, most scholars, I think, would say that as strict historians, such a conclusion lies beyond their reach. Not that they have any better explanation to offer. Uh, all of the old theories, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The fact is that there just is no plausible, naturalistic explanation of these facts. Those are, who are reluctant to infer the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation, because it is supernatural in character, are simply self-confessedly left with no explanation. But what I want to say is that surely, insofar as we are not merely historians, but human beings searching for the meaning of life and existence, we cannot be debarred from drawing such a conclusion. Given the admitted failure of all naturalistic explanations, the rational man can now hardly be blamed if he concludes that on that first Easter morning, a divine miracle has occurred. Thank you. Dr. Price will have 20 minutes.
of you, what you just heard about me, you don't really want to clap, admit it. Uh, um, I'm going to save response to some of those specific points uh, for, for the next uh, little go-round, but uh, read a prepared uh, statement I came up with, and we'll see where it goes from here. Dr. Craig often appeals to the consensus of New Testament scholars on behalf of conservative views. By contrast, I am glad to confess that the opinion of the majority of scholars makes no difference whatever to me. Uh, in, the wor in fact, in the Gospels, after all, it's a consensus of scholars in the Sanhedrin that condemns Jesus to death. Uh, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, you can't settle the question of truth by a majority vote. I think uh, Martin Luther and Galileo and others knew that, too. Uh, if I am interested in a question, I must examine the issues for myself. I reject, for example, Velikovsky's astronomy, not because the Academy sneers at it, which I guess they do, but because his methodology seems flawed to me as I understand it. And forgive me, but so does Dr. Craig's. First, let me call attention to two fundamental axioms of Dr. Craig's work. The first is what strikes me as a kind of double truth model. The second is the old red herring attempt to evade the principle of historical analogy by means of the claim that critics reject miracle stories only because they espouse philosophical naturalism. The second follows from the first, and both commit the fallacy of ad hominem argumentation even while projecting it onto the opponent. I think he tips his hand toward the, first, the end of the first chapter of his book, Reasonable Faith. Uh, he draws a distinction there between knowing Christianity is true and showing that it is true. He says, what then should be our approach in apologetics? It should be something like this. My friend, I know Christianity is true because God's Spirit lives in me and assures me that it is true. And you can know it, too, because God is knocking at the door of your heart, telling you the same thing. If you are sincerely seeking God, then God will give you assurance that the gospel is true. Now, to show you it's true, I'll share with you some arguments and evidence that I really find convincing. But should my arguments seem weak and unconvincing to you, that's my fault, not God's. It only shows that I'm a poor apologist, not that the gospel is untrue. Whatever you think of my arguments, God still loves you and holds you accountable. I'll do my best to present good arguments to you, but ultimately you have to deal not with arguments, but with God himself. Page 48. A little further on, he saith, Unbelief is at the root a spiritual, not an intellectual problem. Sometimes an unbeliever will throw up an intellectual smokescreen so that he can avoid personal existential involvement with the gospel. Uh, pages 49 to 50. Dr. Craig then freely admits his conviction arises from purely subjective factors. To me, it sounds no different in principle from the teenage Mormon door knocker. He tells you he knows the Book of Mormon was written by ancient Americans because he has a warm, swelling feeling inside when he asks God if it's true. Certain intellectual questions have to receive certain answers, then, to be consistent with this revivalistic, heartwarming experience. So Dr. Craig knows in advance that, for example, Strauss and Bultmann must have been wrong. And by hook or by crook, he'll find a way to get from here to there. His enterprise is circular since he grounds Christian belief upon a subjective state described already in Christian theological terminology, God's spirit dwelling in his heart, etc. Dr. Craig seems to admit that he holds his faith on purely subjective grounds, but maintains that he's lucky to discover that the facts, objectively considered, happen to bear out his faith. Whereas theoretically his faith might not prove true to the facts, in actuality, it does. In any case, it's obvious from the same quotes that the arguments are ultimately beside the point. If an unbeliever doesn't see the cogency of Dr. Craig's brand of New Testament criticism, the same thing exactly as his apologetics, it can only be because the doubter has some guilty secret to hide and doesn't want to repent and let Jesus run his life. If one sincerely seeks God, Dr. Craig's arguments will mysteriously start looking pretty good to him.
Dr. Craig's frank expression to his fellow evangelists and apologists is quite revealing. He tells you to say to the unbeliever that you find these arguments really convincing. But how can Dr. Craig simply take this for granted unless, as I'm sure he does, he knows he is writing to people for whom the cogency of the arguments is a foregone conclusion? They are arguments in behalf of a position his readers are already committed to as an a priori party line. His is a position that exalts voluntaristic decision above rational deliberation. Uh, rational deliberation, though good, is by itself not good enough for the evangelist because it can never justify a quick decision such as Campus Crusade's booklet, The Four Spiritual Laws, solicits. Every one of Dr. Craig's scholarly articles on the resurrection implicitly ends with that little decision card for the reader to sign to invite Jesus into his heart as his personal savior. He's not trying to do disinterested historical or exegetical research. He's trying to get folks saved. I know the feeling. I used to be the president of my intervarsity chapter. Note how he characterizes people who do not accept his version of the historical Jesus as unbelievers who merely cast up smoke screens of insincere carping. But this functions as a mirror image of his own enterprise. His apparently self-effacing pose, if my arguments fail to convince, then I must have done a poor job of explaining them, just reveals the whole exercise to be a sham. The arguments are offered cynically, whatever it takes. If they don't work, take your pick between brimstone, God holds you accountable, and treacle, God still loves you. I'm not saying Dr. Craig is wittingly distorting the truth to win his point. Obviously he's not. But he is so committed to a dogmatic party line that he cannot see truth as meaning anything but that party line. Just as Kelly a moment ago said that truth ought to mean a person, not an abstract concept. In Dr. Craig's lexicon, you look up truth and it says, see gospel. To borrow Francis Schaeffer's terminology again, for the apologist, truth becomes merely a connotation word. Just as liberal theologian Albrecht Ritchell said, Jesus has the value of God for us, the apologist might say, Christianity has the value of truth for us. Just as William James said that righteous endeavor was the moral equivalent of war, for apologists, Christianity is the moral equivalent of truth. Only it doesn't work. For Richlianism, Jesus was in fact not God. For William James, moral endeavor was not, in fact, war. Even so, anything that substitutes for the truth may be preferred to the truth, but then it's a fiction. If the charge that unbelievers are hiding behind a smokescreen is a mirror image of the apologist's own strategy, then the naturalistic presuppositions business is a specific instance of such childish, I know you are, but what am I tactics. Does it take a blanket presupposition for a historian to discount some miracle stories like Elisha's axe head on the one extreme or, or the resurrection of Jesus on the other as legendary? No, because as Bultmann recognized, there is no problem accepting reports even of extraordinary things that we can verify as still occurring today, like faith healings and exorcisms. However you may wish to account for them, you can go to certain meetings and see scenes resembling those in the Gospels. So it is by no means a matter of rejecting all miracle stories on principle. Biblical critics are not like Carl Sagan or James Randi, going into every investigation already convinced that the paranormal must be a fraud. No, they take miracle stories on a case-by-case -case basis. But such a selective, piecemeal, and probabilistic acceptance of miracle stories is not what apologists want. They take umbrage that biblical critics do not wind up accepting any and all biblical miracles. So, if it would not require a blanket principle to reject the historicity of particular mir miracle stories, we must ask if it would take a blanket principle to require acceptance of all biblical miracles. Clearly it would.
And that principle cannot be mere supernaturalism that is openness to the possibility that miracles can occur. One can believe God capable of anything without believing that he actually did everything anybody may say he did. One can believe in the possibility of miracles without believing that every reported miracle must have occurred. No, the requisite principle for accepting all biblical miracles is the principle of biblical inerrancy. The belief that all biblical narratives are historically accurate simply because they appear in the Bible. After all, it will not greatly upset Dr. Craig any more than it upset Warfield to deny the historical accuracy of medieval reports of miracles wrought by the Virgin Mary or the sacramental wafer, much less stories of miracles wrought by Gautama Buddha or Apollonius of Tyana. Supernaturalism is not at all the issue here. The issue is whether the historian is to abdicate his role as a sifter of evidence by accepting the dogma of inerrancy, even if clandestinely. I know Dr. Craig says he is sticking only to the elements of the gospel story accepted as historical by most scholars, but this is only tactical. He's shortening the apologetical line of defense. Once he has you in the fold, he'll press on to full inerrantism. Nor is naturalism the issue when the historian employs the principle of analogy. As F.H. Bradley showed in the presuppositions of critical history, no historical inference is possible unless the historian assumes a basic analogy of past experience with present experience. If we do not grant this, nothing will seem amiss in believing stories that A turned into a werewolf or B changed lead into gold. Hey, just because we don't see it happening today doesn't prove it never did. One could just as easily accept the historicity of Jack and the Beanstalk on the same basis as long as one's sole criterion for historical plausibility is anything goes. If there are ancient parallel legends about other saviors and sages rising from death or ascending into heaven, but there is no present day instance, is the historian to be maligned as a narrow dogmatist or a moral coward refusing to repent if he judges the story of Jesus' resurrection as probably a legend too? The historical axiom of analogy does not dogmatize. Critical historians are not engaging in metaphysics and epistemology uh, as if they could hop into a time machine and pontificate, A didn't happen, B did. Again, Dr. Craig and his brethren are just projecting. It is they and not critical historians who want to be able to point to sure results. Imagine a creed. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath probably raised him from the dead, thou shalt most likely be saved. Now, who's the joke on there? Historians don't have creeds. They frame hypotheses. Sure, you can find some high-bound prop, some small-minded, insecure windbag who will not budge from a pet theory because he has too much personally invested in it. But you have no trouble recognizing such a person as a hack, a fake, a bad historian who ought to know better, Holocaust deniers, for example. The last thing you do is to emulate such behavior and make it into an operating principle. But apologists do. Again, it's projection. It reduces to this. At the end of the Four Spiritual Laws booklet, there's a cartoon diagram showing a toy locomotive engine labeled Fact, pulling a coal car labeled Faith, followed in turn by a superfluous caboose tagged Feeling. The new convert is admonished to let faith rest on fact, not to allow faith to waver with feelings. But one must suspect that it is the caboose that is pulling the train and pulling it backward. Faith is based firmly on feeling, and certain notions are postulated as fact and defended as such because of the security they afford the sick soul who seeks a port in the existential storm. Dr. Craig has had occasion to cross swords with John Dominic Crossan. One need not agree with Crossan, I seldom do, 
to appreciate that he is, however, an innovative and creative New Testament scholar, that he marshals his vast learning in an attempt to find out new things from the Gospels. Crossan is concerned to advance the state of knowledge. Contrast him with Dr. Craig, who uses his own formidable erudition in one vast damage control operation. Every effort of Dr. Craig's is to squelch new theories that threaten to cast doubt on the traditional picture of the storybook Jesus. One feels that Dr. Craig would sooner put his efforts elsewhere than putting out fires lit by Bultmann, Strauss, and Crossan. If he had his way, he'd be occupied with something more edifying. At least that's a feeling I get. Evangelicals think they've got the truth in their back pocket, so they can't be trying to find what they think they've already got. Novelty is the devil. They expend great time and efforts mastering the skills of Greek and Hebrew exegesis, witness the unparalleled excellence of Dallas Theological Seminary in these areas. But for what? All their efforts at exegesis are the laborings of a mountain to bring forth a mouse. If one of them really comes up with something new theologically, it will result in immediate charges of heresy. The effort is solely to hold the fort against the advance of intellectual history. Dr. Craig everywhere presupposes a pre-critical picture of the Gospels as straightforward records of reporting without tendential bias. He tries to make the mark an empty tomb tale, a piece of sober contemporary history. We're told that the story is unvarnished history since it betrays no signs of theological tendency. No theological coloring? In a story told to attest the resurrection of a son of God from the dead? What else is it? Isn't it all varnish? For mica instead of wood? Charles Talbert, by the way, no God-hating atheist, but a Southern Baptist, in his book, What is a Gospel?, has no trouble adducing abundant parallels from Hellenistic hero biographies in which the ascensions into heaven of Romulus, Aeneas, Hercules, Aristeus, Empedocles, Apollonius, etc., are inferred from the utter failure of their searching disciples to find any vestige of their bones, bodies, or clothing where they might might be expected to be found. Sometimes uh, they make a post-mortem appearance to their grieving and worshipful worshipful followers. These stories, like all ancient miracle tales, include the element of initial skepticism by the disciples, who were then convinced despite themselves. It's just a narrative device. None of them are factual reports. Talbert concludes that the empty tomb and resurrection stories in the Gospels would have been familiar genres to ancient readers, as of course they were. Pagan critics hastened to point out the similarities, and Christian apologists lamely countered that Satan had counterfeited the Gospel episodes in advance to throw unbelievers off the track. Excuse me. Contra Dr. Craig, the empty tomb story is theological through and through. If we're truly interested in history, how can we dismiss other ancient vanished body and post-mortem appearance stories, making an exception in the single case of Jesus who just happens to be the founder of our religion? And once we recognize the gospel resurrection narratives to be cut from the same cloth, all questions of whether the women went to the wrong tomb or if the disciples stole the body or rented it or whatever, or whether the Sanhedrin could have produced it with dental records to prove who it was or whether the disciples saw a hallucination or a case of mistaken identity, it's all seemed to be moot. He says that Talbert has so misinterpreted the ancient evidence that his book is unusable in its present state, and yet this is the basis upon which Dr. Price's theories are founded. When you look at these myths more carefully, what you discover is an incredible diversity among them. For example, some are just mythical symbols of the crop cycle, uh, as in the case of Tammuz, uh, Osiris, and Adonis. Others are apotheosis stories about the assumption of the hero into heaven, as in the case of Hercules or Romulus. Others are disappearance stories. They ask 
Where has the hero gone? And the answer is, he lives on in another life, a higher sphere. Apollonius and Empedocles would be examples. Others are just plain old political emperor worship, as in the case of Julius Caesar and Augustus. None of these is parallel to the Jewish idea of resurrection from the dead. David Allen concludes, no parallel to resurrection traditions is to be found in Greco-Roman biography. The narratives of Jesus' resurrection must therefore be interpreted within a Jewish context. What scholars came to realize is that pagan mythology is simply the wrong interpretive context for understanding the Gospels. Secondly, in any case, there is no causal connection between pagan myths and the origin of the disciples' belief. You see, Jews found these pagan myths abhorrent. And therefore, Jewish writers like Philo and Josephus, even though they're willing to refer to Moses as a divine man because of his great virtue and good works, they reject any attempt to immortalize or deify him. And therefore, as Gerhard Kittel points out, there is no trace of cults of dying and rising gods in first century Palestine. Moreover, as the New Testament scholar Hans Grass observes, it would be unthinkable that the earliest disciples, these original Galilean fishermen, would come to sincerely believe that Jesus was risen from the dead because they had heard folk tales of Hercules. I mean, get real, this would be like you're coming to believe that a, a deceased friend is risen from the dead because you saw E.T. come back to life in the movie. So, for these two reasons, contemporary scholarship has simply moved beyond the old history of religion's uh, school. Now, the presupposition of Dr. Price's mythological theory is that Paul's testimony in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 11, is a later interpolation. Otherwise, what do you do with an indisputably authentic letter from a man who knew personally Jesus' younger brother? and chief disciple, as well as hundreds of other people, all of whom claim to have seen Jesus alive after his death. You've got to say that Paul didn't really write this stuff. It's a later interpolation. Now, I've already said that no New Testament scholar believes such a thing, but now let me explain why. Uh, and I'm afraid here of getting bogged down in the details, but I just don't know of any other way to expose uh, Dr. Price's mistakes than doing this, so just bear with me, please. Dr. Price presents an incredibly complicated theory, according to which verses 3 to 11 are an interpolation of an interpolation of a fabrication of a quotation. Now, why would we believe such a complicated, uh, contrived theory as opposed to the simple, universally accepted view that Paul himself wrote these sentences. In terms of the external evidence, not a single manuscript of 1 Corinthians lacks these verses. They're all there. Moreover, the situation is even worse than that, because these supposedly interpolated verses are quoted as part of 1 Corinthians 15 by extra-biblical authors like Ignatius, Tertullian, and Irenaeus. And therefore, Dr. Price is forced, in his own words, to deny the date and the genuineness of First Clement and the Ignatian Corpus. Now, this is simply asking too much. It just strains credulity beyond its limits. So the external evidence is overwhelming in favor of the authenticity of these verses. Now, what about the internal evidence? Well, Dr. Price argues that Paul's saying uh, I delivered to you what I also received uh, up in verse uh, 1 is incompatible with what he says about the gospel preached by him in Galatians where he says, I did not receive it from man, but through a revelation of Jesus Christ. But this is a very tenuous argument, I think. What Paul is talking about in Galatians is the gospel of salvation by grace, not the historical facts of Jesus' death and resurrection, which is what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. The contradiction is wholly imaginary. Uh, 
actually the internal evidence strongly supports authenticity. For example, in verse 1, Paul says, uh, I make known to you the gospel which I preach to you. But on Dr. Price's view, if you leave these verses out, then that's precisely what Paul does not do. He does not make known to them the gospel that he preached to them. If you skip right down to verse 12. Moreover, the uh, scroll down, please. The uh, first person plural pronouns in verses 12 to 15, like our preaching is in vain. We are found to be misrepresenting Christ. Refer back to the apostles in verses 9 to 11. Uh, so that if you say this is an interpolation, then these pronouns have no antecedents anymore. This is firmly embedded in its context. Moreover, when Paul says Christ is preached as raised from the dead, that refers back to verse 11. So we preached and so you believe. Now, Dr. Price might say, well, no, it refers back to verse 1, where Paul says, I preach to you the gospel. But here's where English translations can be misleading. In the Greek, this is a totally different verb than the verb here in verse 12. Verse 12 matches the verb in verse 11, and that is the gospel that he's referring to when he says, so we preached and so you believe. Moreover, this past perfect form of the Greek verb, he has been raised, is a non-Pauline word. It's found no place else in the Pauline uh, corpus or correspondence. Where does this come from? Well, it refers back up to uh, verse 4. He was raised, quoted from the old Christian tradition, which Paul received. So that these verses are firmly embedded in the context and are not a later interpolation. Second point I'd like to make is that the logic of the chapter requires these verses. Paul presents a syllogism in effect. He says, premise one, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. Premise two, the, that uh, Christ has been raised. Three, therefore, the dead are raised, and the Corinthians are wrong. So that the evidence for the second premise is all of the evidence for the resurrection appearances in verses 3 to 8. If you leave those out, then you emasculate Paul's evidence for his second premise that Christ has been raised from the dead. And thus, by omitting these verses, you destroy the logic of the chapter. So what I'm suggesting is that both the external and the internal evidence overwhelmingly support the authenticity of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 11. And that destroys, ladies and gentlemen, the theory that Jesus is purely mythological and that these appearances are nothing but myths. Now, in my last two minutes, let me respond to Dr. Price's allegations that he made at the beginning of his speech. I didn't expect to be talking about religious epistemology and philosophy, but I think my position is quite consistent. I'm saying I know that Christ is risen by his immediate reality in my life, but that doesn't prove it to you. So to prove it to you, I have to give objective evidence of what I know subjectively by his living reality in my life. That's a perfectly consistent position and is defended by the world's greatest living Christian philosopher today, Alvin Plantinga. So I don't see any problem with that. As for supernaturalism, I am glad that he's open to the miraculous, and I am not asking him to believe in all the Bible miracles. For example, Raymond Brown, whom I quoted, denies the historicity of the virgin birth, but he still affirms the resurrection of Jesus because of the evidence for the resurrection. I'm suggesting just be open to the evidence. That's all I ask. And I think that when you are genuinely open-minded and look at the evidence, then it is certainly firm and secure enough to justify the conclusion that God raised Jesus from the dead. By the way, I think Brown said he did believe in the virgin birth because the Pope said so. He just couldn't prove it. Um, anyway, uh, about 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I say that uh, verse 3 is part of the interpolation, so that, that's some of the, that is not a problem for me. 3 through 11 is the interpolation in my theory. Uh, I'm not the first to, to, uh, to say it. Various other scholars have, though they've not uh, said why. This is why I think so, though. Uh, 
problems with it, by the way, the, uh, there are no copies of 1 Corinthians early enough to settle a question of interpolation, of which many have been suggested. Uh, we just lack the evidence, and in fact, no early writer, uh, Ignatius or anybody else, quotes the parts of it that, that deal with this. I went through that rather specifically. I tend to think that uh, First Clement, which is pseudonymous and seems to me to make references to the apocryphal gospel traditions, and uh, Ignatius' letters, as others have argued before, are not as early as they're supposed to be, but it has nothing to do with my view on this. Uh, the, uh, the idea, of what, the reasons I find 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3 through 11 to be likely an interpolation is, for one thing, form critically. It's, it, it's a creed uh, that uh, seems, in fact, it's supposed to be, by all scholars' admission, a composite digest of fragments from creedal and other formulaic statements. Uh, any creed seems to me to be characteristic of a later institutionalizing stage of a religion, something long after the time of Paul. Uh, the, the idea that there is no contradiction between 1 Corinthians and Galatians seems to me just a, an outrageous example of, of harmonizing, glossing. I mean, here in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives you the terms of the gospel he preached first of all. Uh, and in Galatians, he says, and, and those terms in 1 Corinthians are what he was given by some superiors, the very superiors that cannot exist according to first, the first chapter of Galatians. It seems to me that's a howling contradiction that you just can't make go away. The 500 brethren uh, in this interpolation, as I see it, uh, th th this is something out of the Gospel of Nicodemus. If this were part of the Gospel tradition, somebody tell me how it never makes it into any of the Gospels. Uh, it, it just It's in impossible and no one would have thought it worth mentioning uh, if, if it was already around as a memory. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, parts of the, the uh, creed quoted, James and all the apostles, Cephas and the Twelve, as Harnack showed long ago, this seems to be a scotch taping together by way of reconciliation between two uh, creeds, that uh, one exalting the authority of James as the head of the Jewish Christians, the other exalting the authority of Cephas or Peter. The fact that we find them side by side indicates that conflict has been papered over long ago. This cannot have happened at the time of, of uh, the apostles. Paul. It seems to me that all manner of things indicate uh, this, uh, and, and in fact, many commentators, Bultmann, Skelebakes, and others, uh, it's all in the eye of the beholder, whether it fits or not, but many have said that it do doesn't seem to, that Paul seems to be taking for granted that the Corinthians believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That's not his point. He's, his point in the rest of the chapter is, since you believe that, what's the big deal with us rising from the dead at the end? So I don't see a lot of those as, as, as problematical. I, I certainly do not think I need to pry this out of context to, to avert the terrible prospect of saying that early Christians saw visions of Jesus raised from the dead. I mean, I've known people that have seen visions. Once I was in a, a, a bookstore buying some theological classic, I think it was Lynn Carter's Thongor in the Dragon City, uh, and uh, he, he, this woman said, uh, she asked me somehow what I was into, I told her the study of religion. She said, oh, well, you know, and this lady was in her 80s, I'd say, really sweet lady. She said that uh, her family was all very very long lived. Uh, just about everybody had lived to be at least a hundred, and she wanted to as well. And so one night Jesus appeared to her, and and he said, "What would you want? I'll give you one request." She said, "Well, I want to live to be a uh, hundred too." And he said, "Okay, you got it." And she said, "That's not good enough. I want your signature on it." And so Jesus signed a piece of paper, an agreement. Boy, I would love to have seen that. Now, did, should I believe that this woman had an actual visitation from Jesus Christ? Sorry. You know, what, was she a uh, hoaxer? Was this some kind of, Heck no, who knows what's going on in her head? Oral Roberts said he saw Jesus as big as King Kong outside his hospital. He's probably not lying, but I don't buy it. People see visions of the Virgin Mary. I'm not going to turn to a really sweet lady. She said that uh, her family was all very long lived. Uh, just about everybody had lived to be at least a hundred. And she wanted to as well. And so one night Jesus appeared to her. And, and he said, what would you want? I'll give you one request. She said, well, I want to live to be a uh, hundred too. And he said, okay, you've got it. And she said, that's not good enough. I want your signature on it. And so Jesus signed a piece of paper, an agreement. Boy, I would love to have seen that. Now, did, should I believe that this woman had had an actual visitation from Jesus Christ? Sorry. You know, what, was she a uh, hoaxer? Was this some kind of, Heck no, who knows what's going on in her head? Oral Roberts said he saw Jesus as big as King Kong outside his hospital. Uh, he's probably not lying, but I don't buy it. People see visions of the Virgin Mary. I'm not going to turn to a Catholic. You know, it, 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 sure you can have
have a list of visions. That's no problem for me. They don't prove anything any more than ancient legends do. But the problem is we don't really know anything about the, the most ancient disciples, whether they died for their faith. We have only later legends that have a martyred and grotesque manners. Uh, well, just like we have legends of the founding churches in Armenia and Great Britain and so on. Uh, there, there's no real evidence about what happened to these guys Easter morning or at the end of their lives. Uh, we, we just uh, can't go from the, the transformation of the disciples. We don't know what their form of Christian faith or that of James was. You can't assume that every New Testament writer believed everything that every other New Testament writer did. Uh, are there other traditions about the burial of Jesus? Well, there, there are some minor ones. That doesn't seem to me to be a big problem. But the notion that, that the history of religion school is passé is just ludicrous. It's wishful thinking. People uh, used to say, Kenneth Hawkins in an InterVarsity book said that nobody believes in redaction criticism anymore. Yeah, you wish, pal. Uh, it, it's, it's absurd. Uh, we, we have a kind of an era of retrenchment where, uh, where conservatives have dominated the professional structure and are sort of just kissing goodbye the scholarly methods they, they don't like. And uh, no one has ever refuted the history of religion school. It's still going strong. And I welcome you to listen to a couple. Of, well, maybe later I'll get to, to uh, read you a couple of these uh, parallels with dying and rising gods, ascended sages, which strike me as quite uh, relevant, quite parallel. Uh, how, how parallel does it have to be? Do you have to have the Savior named Jesus? I mean, you know, it, 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 I'm not saying that any of these things was borrowed by Christians from non-Christians. My point is simply that, as Dr. Craig correctly said, the ancient world was a syncretistic stew, a wash in all these myth themes. It's certainly no surprise when we find them in Christianity in various combinations as we do elsewhere. Jews in Palestine were certainly uh, familiar with them and long had been. Ezekiel tells us how the women of Jerusalem at the time of the exile were mourning the, for, for Tammuz, a dying and rising God, uh, whose resurrection is probably even... Uh, mentioned in uh, the, the Song of Songs. That's probably the, uh, the, the, the man who, who will yield, who'll be yielded up by death to the love which is stronger than death, etc. There are various traces of old Baal religions uh, and such in the Old Testament. These things didn't have to be imported from, from somewhere else. You didn't have to have professors come in and tell you about these things. Second Maccabees tells us that various Jews had willingly or not uh, converted to the Dionysus religion with many of the same uh, myth themes. It's not not like nobody had ever heard of this. And I certainly don't mean to say the disciples of Jesus looked up a comparative religion book and say, hey, we ought to borrow this. Things don't happen overnight that way. Uh, well, one last thing. I do not exactly say that uh, Jesus never existed. My position rather is that uh, what is true, in my opinion, of the end of the earthly life of Jesus, the resurrection stories, the empty tomb stories, is true of the recorded life of Jesus throughout. Namely, every inch of it, every bit of it, like the story of Moses, like the story of Buddha, uh, is, is all hagiography. It's all teaching material. It's all uh, parable, etc. There may well have been of Jesus, but if so, he has been as completely assimilated to the mythic hero archetype of, as any of these other figures. He may have been real, like the prophet Muhammad was. He may have been fictitious, like Oedipus probably was. There's simply no way to know. Uh, I do uh, proudly represent older critical views, that those of the Dutch radical school of the 19th century, for whom Ferdinand Christian Bauer was too conservative. But uh, this, this constant appeal to the consensus and the authority of reviewers who may have all kinds of reasons for rejecting Talbert's book. The implication that I believe what I do only because I'm proof texting Talbert as an authority, it's absurd. Uh, who cares what, what Christian scholars think, what atheist scholars think? You can't appeal to authority, but it certainly is especially dubious when the whole profession is made of believing Christians. It's not like you've got some kind of Martians who've come out of here from total objectivity and example the evidence. Uh, m I mean, my, my views may not be accurate, but, but you owe it to yourself to look at the individual issues and not just to, to let uh, views be dissed because some big name scholar says so. I do not appeal to the authority of any scholars because none have authority. That should be clear ever since uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, science would never have gotten anywhere without a particular view of the evidence. Don't mean to say Dr. Craig does not look at the evidence. Of course he does. But it seems to me that, that, that it's highly clouded by this constant fallacious appeal to big names and consensus. Thank you.
Thank you. Each will now have eight minutes. Now let me review those two contentions I said I would defend tonight. First, that there are four established facts concerning Jesus' fate. Number one, his honorable burial by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and here I gave five lines of evidence for this fact. Uh, and I think that Dr. Price only criticized one of these, and that was that there are no competing burial accounts uh, other than the burial by Joseph of Arimathea. He just asserted, well, there are some. Well, I think that's simply false. In his writings, he's referring to certain expressions in the book of Acts, where in Acts it says to the Jews uh, that you buried uh, Jesus. But what you need to understand is that those passages represent that same hostility toward the Jewish leaders I spoke about, because the book of Acts also blames the Jewish leaders for the crucifixion of Jesus. So this doesn't represent some sort of independent burial tradition. The burial traditions are unanimous that it was Joseph of Arimathea who laid Jesus in the tomb, and that counts in favor of the burial. That is an important fact about the, about the uh, fate of Jesus. Secondly, I then gave five lines of evidence for the empty tomb. And as far as I can see, he only responded to one of these, namely, I said the account was simple and lacked signs of legendary development. And Dr. Price exclaimed, in a story about the resurrection of the Son of God, but the point, I think, that I made was when you compare this to later legendary accounts, there's a conspicuous absence of theological and apologetical motifs. All you have is basically the women's discovery of the tomb, and it's empty. And that isn't loaded with any kind of theological reflection or apologetical development. That is not a supernaturalistic uh, story. That could simply be a factual account, and you need to ask, how did the tomb get empty? So I think he needs to do better than that to refute the point about the relative simplicity of the account. If it were a later legend, it would certainly be more embellished. I then gave two lines of evidence for the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and he really hasn't responded to either of those, the argument from 1 Corinthians 15 and then from the multiple independent attestation in the Gospels. We'll talk about 1 Corinthians in a minute. And finally, I gave three uh, lines of evidence concerning the origin of the disciples' belief and Dr. Price didn't address any of those specifically. So I think we've got good grounds for saying these facts are established. Now, when I quote the majority of scholars, therefore, what I'm simply trying to communicate to you is that these reasons that I give are found convincing by the majority of scholars, whether liberal, moderate, or conservative. It's funny that Dr. Price has moved from his fundamentalist background on the right, which he rejects, to positions which are as extreme on the left. It's as though the pendulum has swung from one extreme to the other. And these are extremist positions that he holds, which are even rejected by fellows in the Jesus Seminar. It's not a matter of this being just due to the discipline being made up of Christians or dominated by conservatives. Even the Jesus Seminar people, who are skeptical critics, reject this mythology theory. So please don't try to say this is due to some conspiracy of Christian scholars. Now, what about my arguments against his mythology theory? I said, first of all, the parallels are spurious. Um, and I, I showed the diversity of these. None of these are resurrection accounts. And, and I think that remains unrefuted. I said there was no causal connection between these myths and the original disciples coming to believe in Jesus as risen. And he said, well, the Jews were familiar with these. Yes. And they rejected them. I said they were abhorrent to Jews. Martin Hengel, in his book, uh, Judaism and Hellenism, says, the development of the apocalyptic resurrection, immortality, judgment doctrine in Jewish Palestine explains why the Hellenistic mystery religions could gain virtually no influence there. So it's unthinkable to think these original disciples would really come to believe and be ready to die for the belief Jesus rose from the dead because they'd heard stories of Hercules and Romulus. He says, well, things like this don't happen overnight. Well, that's just the problem with the resurrection. The belief in the resurrection was sudden. It was these original disciples. How do you explain this transformation uh, and, and the origin of this belief he has risen from the dead? I then argued that 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 11 is not an interpolation. With respect to the external evidence, he admits that no manuscript lacks these verses, but he says they're not early enough. I beg to differ. The Charles Beatty papyri 
uh, comes from A.D. 200. It is one of our most precious and early manuscripts, and it contains all of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, well, with respect to Ignatius, that Ignatius doesn't quote the right passages. I beg to differ. If you look at Ignatius Ad Romanos, chapter 9, he quotes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 8 to 9, exactly the passage that Dr. Price says isn't supposed to be there. So the external evidence overwhelmingly supports the authenticity of Paul's evidence. What about the internal evidence? I argued there's no contradiction between 1 Corinthians and Galatians. He said, but this is a creed which is composite in nature. It's a legitimation formula for authority in the early church. I think not. A couple of points. Number one, there were no competing leadership groups such as this. There was no competing leadership group focused on Peter and on James in the early church. Moreover, the order of the formula is chronological. Then, 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 and last of all. So that it is not based on leadership groups. Secondly, authority in the early church was not based on who had seen a resurrection appearance. Not everybody who saw an appearance was invested with apostolic authority. Think of the 500 brethren. By the same token, not everybody who was an apostle had seen a resurrection appearance. Think of Barnabas. Paul, when he grounded and defended his apostleship, appealed to the fact that the Lord had commissioned him to go with the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says, I performed the signs of of a true apostle among you. He didn't ground it simply in having seen a resurrection appearance. So I don't think you can write these off as legitimation formulas in the early church. He says, why isn't the appearance to the 500 brethren mentioned elsewhere? Well, I think it may be because it occurred in Galilee, where the multitudes had flocked to hear Jesus teach. And the Gospels tend to focus on the Jerusalem appearances. I would also suggest that, in fact, the mountaintop appearance mentioned in Matthew 28 could be the appearance to the 500 brethren. Because unlike all the other resurrection appearances, this one was by appointment. It was a rendezvous between Jesus and the disciples. And we know at least the women were included there, as well as the twelve. This could have been to a broader crowd as well. Notice also that this same kind of argument from silence is a double-edged sword, because I could use it to argue for the early dating of Acts and the Gospels, because it doesn't mention the destruction of Jerusalem, the persecution of Nero, the martyrdom of James, uh, etc., etc., which would show, again, these aren't legendary fictions. They go too close back to the original events. I then showed how 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 11 is firmly embedded in its context. I did not assume verse 3 was not part of the interpolation. He's incorrect there. And I showed how the logic of the argument requires these verses. So I basically think we have every good ground for believing that these are not myths. These are not legends. These are reports of what these actual disciples saw and experienced. And I think the best explanation for these is that these men were telling the truth. Jesus really had risen. As for the empty tomb stories uh, not being theological, uh, the whole notion of the women disciples and only them seeking out the body of, of their Lord is part and parcel of the mystery religion background, which indeed was known to Jews and accepted by many. You only have hair pulling denunciations by some rabbis because they were attracted to Jews. Uh, the women, Isis and Nephthys, thought, sought the body of Osiris after uh, he had been uh, chopped up and uh, killed by uh, the betrayer set and, and then they kind of religious spirituality. This is also why the women's testimony is not mentioned uh, as, uh, well, it's not uh, why there's no problem with uh, the idea of women being credible witnesses. These stories did not originate as apologetics. They, they originated as ritual uh, mourning laments, uh, like these other religions that were in the same neighborhood. Uh, we know that Jews did not have, not all Jews, I should say, as if they were a monolith, rejected these religions. In the Dura Europa Synagogue, there are mosaics that show 
show Hercules. There's, uh, there's, uh, Yahweh depict, Jehovah depicted as Zeus riding his chariot through the zodiac. Uh, these people were anything but anti-syncretistic. Some were, obviously, like Judah Maccabee. But they wouldn't have been upset if there weren't others who were willing to go along with the whole Hellenistic, uh, package. Uh, as for there being no parallel in, uh, Jewish expectation for the, uh, resurrection of someone ahead of time before the end of times, how about John the Baptist? The Gospel of Mark tells us that some people thought Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead in an eschatological way, which is why miraculous powers were at work in him. Uh, you, you can't quite seal these things off hermetically that way. You know, this belief is later than that one. Uh, the earliest beliefs of the earliest Christians are much in dispute, but for what, what it's worth, many scholars have uh, imagined an early Christianity that did not depend upon a belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Scylla makes points to the Kenosis hymn in uh, Philippians uh, 2, 6 through 11, which makes no reference to a resurrection at all, but merely a post-mortem exaltation. The Q document seems to come from a community, at, at least if you agree with uh, most scholars today. You don't have to, right? But just as a matter of interest, they, they would say there was a Q community, uh, Reed Burton Mack and others, which did not uh, seem to, to say anything about the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus or even a saving death. As for the idea that uh, that uh, a vision of Jesus functioned as a credential, take a look at Reginald R. Fuller's formation of the resurrection narratives for a good argument that at least they did. Uh, for instance, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? As if the two are the same thing. I can only say this stuff about the uh, the, harmoniz- the uh, 500 is just a desperate harmonization. Ask yourself if anybody would say these things if they weren't trying to get out of a tight spot. Uh, it just seems to me uh, you know, wrestling exegesis. You know, you got to uh, pin that opponent. Um, as for uh, these parallels, you ask yourself if if there's no parallel here. Think of the doubting Thomas episode. Here's one from Apollonius of Tyana. This is after Apollonius has disappeared from a locked temple, and a heavenly voice said he had gone to heaven, so those who sought him could not find him. This is after that. His disciples are together studying. There came to Tyana a youth who did not shrink from acrimonious discussions. He'd been happy here tonight. And who, could, who would not accept truth in argument. Now Apollonius had already passed away from among men, but people still wondered at his passing, and no one ventured to dispute that he was immortal. This being so, the discussions were mainly about the soul, for a band of youths there were passionately addicted to wisdom. The young man in question, however, would on no account allow the tenet of immortality of the soul and said, I myself, gentlemen, have done nothing now for nine months but to pray to Apollonius that he would re- reveal to me the truth about the soul, but he is so utterly dead that he will not appear to me in response to my entreaties nor give me any reason to consider him immortal. Such were the young man's words on that occasion, but on the fifth day following, after discussing the same subject, he fell asleep where he was talking with them, and of the young men who were studying with them, some were reading books and others were industriously drawing geometrical figures on the ground, when on a sudden, like one possessed, he leaped up still in half sleep, streaming with perspiration, and cried out, I believe thee. And when those who were present asked him what was the matter, do you not see, said he, Apollonius the sage, how that he is present with us? And is listening to our discussion and is reciting wondrous verses about the soul. But where is he, they asked, for we cannot see him anywhere, although we would rather do so than possess all the blessings of mankind. And the youth replied, it would seem that he has come to converse with me alone concerning the things I would not believe. I've got one about the ascension of Moses, about uh, the, uh, the uh, well, here's, here's a quickie, uh, so about the Emmaus Road. Tell me if this is an irrelevant non-parallel. Here's a miracle story from the Epidaurus healing shrine of Asclepius, son of Apollo, killed by Zeus but raised from the dead. So Strata of Phare had a false pregnancy. In fear and trembling, she came in a litter to the sanctuary of Asclepius and slept there, expecting to receive divine guidance toward a cure. But she had no clear dream and started for home again. There, then near Cernai, she dreamt that a man, comely in appearance, fell in with her and her companions. When he learned about their bad luck, he bade them set down the litter on which they were carrying Sostrata. Then he cu- cut open her belly and removed an enormous quantity of worms 
worms. Then he stitched up her belly and made the woman well. Then Asclepius revealed his presence and bade her send thank offerings for the cure to Epidaurus, the main cult center. Is this an irrelevant story that has nothing to do with it? I mean, it seems like the same script with the name changes. Uh, eager disciples go to the main shrine looking for, for deliverance from, from uh, the God, the Son of God. Disappointed, go home on the way, miraculous visitation, uh, not recognized at first. First, the, the desired miracle is, is, uh, is confirmed and then presto, uh, gone. It seems to me to deny the parallels, and there are several others, uh, no time at the moment I see to get into all of them, are, are by no means far-fetched and irrelevant. You don't expect them to sound all exactly alike. That's the point of an ideal type. They're, they're all cut from the same cloth, not exactly identical, and to just use the, the, uh, the, the fact that they don't exactly match whereas no phenomenon of any kind ever do, uh, to, to say that the parallels that are there are irrelevant, again, seems to me a tactic of... Well, I am so gratified that I finally read some of these supposed parallels, because I think listening to them, you saw exactly the point that I was trying to make. Any similarities are just sort of incidental features of the narrative. But in the core, the essence of the type, they're not at all the same. The Apollonius, Apollonius story is something to teach the immortality of the soul. Asclepius was a healing god, uh, and even Dr. Price recognizes that Jesus of Nazareth was a miracle healer, or at least uh, purported to be, so that in essence these are not at all similar. I would also point out that uh, Philostratus, who wrote the Apollonius stories, was commissioned to write something directly as a counterpart to the Christian religion. This is post-Christian stuff. So Apollonius is designed to play off the Christ figure of the gospel. But again, these, these stories have only incidental simul similarities. They are not similar in their core. So I don't think we've seen any good reason to think that uh, you can explain the resurrection by mythology. The point is that scholars have come to recognize that Jesus needs to be understood in a Jewish context not a pagan mythological context. He was a Jew, the disciples were Jews, and it is out of that Jewish context which taught resurrection of the dead that Jesus needs to be understood. Now tonight we've seen, first of all, four facts established about the historical Jesus. His honorable burial. I I've seen no refutation about that, and that is key, because if the site of Jesus' burial were known in Jerusalem, there is no way the resurrection faith could have come to exist and flourish there. Number two, the empty tomb. The only uh, refutation offered against this was concerning the role of the women, and it was charged this came from the myth of Isis and Osiris. Again, I think this is fanciful. When you read the myths, as I've done, what this story is, is the story of how Osiris, the Egyptian king, was killed by Typho, his brother-in-law, and his body was cut into 14 pieces and, uh, and, and, and dismembered. And his wife, then Isis, went about looking for these different fragments of his body so that she can assemble them and bury them. And uh, Plutarch says this is why there are so many tombs of Osiris in Egypt, by the way. A uh, nice explanation of why you have all these different accounts in contrast to the single burial account in the Gospels. So this isn't at all comparable to the women going to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus, I think. As for the post-mortem appearances, again, I, we've seen no refutation of my arguments there. And concerning the ori origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection, Dr. Price uh, said, well, Jesus was claimed to be John the Baptist risen from the dead. This shows you could have a resurrection before the end of the world. Not at all. This isn't a literal resurrection from the dead because John and Jesus were living at the same time. So they couldn't possibly have thought that Jesus was John risen from the dead. They were contemporaries. Rather, this is the typical Jewish way of saying that Jesus was clothed with the mantle and the power of John the Baptist and his ministry, just as John the Baptist was said to be Elijah. Dr. Price says, well, there's a Q community which did not believe in the resurrection. I challenge him to give us any evidence for that fact. According to Luke Johnson in his book, The Real Jesus, there is no evidence of communities not holding to the resurrection of Jesus. N.T. Wright, whom I quoted before, said the cross and resurrection are clearly central to virtually all known forms of early Christianity. And yet, how do you explain the origin of that belief apart from the event itself? 
Now, Dr. Price said that all of my scholarly articles end with an implicit appeal to uh, sign the, uh, the, the bottom line at the end of the Four Laws booklet. So it would be inappropriate for me to close tonight without making such an appeal. Uh, hey, now, <laughs> wait, wait. I want to say that I, am, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I came to faith in Christ as a teenager as I was looking for the meaning to life and existence. I picked up a New Testament and began to read about Jesus of Nazareth. And I'd never read wisdom like this before. This man captivated me. I was arrested by what he had to say. There was the ring of truth about his words and an authenticity about what he had to say his life. And after a period of about six months of intense soul searching, I just came to the end of my rope and, and cried out to God to save me. And I experienced a sort of spiritual rebirth within my life. God became a living reality to me that has never left me. A reality that I believe that you too can find if you will seek him with an open heart and an open mind. So I'd encourage you to do what I did. Pick up the New Testament and begin to read it. I think you can find, as I did, that Christ can become not merely a shadowy figure of the distant historical past, but a living reality that you can know is risen because you are personally related to him today. Thank you. I certainly rejoice in the wisdom attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. I preach from the Bible most every Sunday in, the, in house church uh, services in my home. I certainly am no enemy of religion, religious people, or of Christianity. I do not think, however, that transformative experiences can settle facts of the past any more than it can when Rudolf Steiner felt so impelled by his intuitive insights that he said that uh, the Buddha was a disciple of Christian Rosenkreutz and things like that. He, he, he thought he had some epistemological as access to what had happened in the past based on how he felt. That, I'm sorry, the one does not translate into the other. Uh, and uh, and uh, is there evidence here? Well, you know, I, I think there, there is not. You cannot take verisimilitude in fiction like there's nothing particularly implausible about Joseph of Arimathea burying Jesus and say, well, therefore it happened. I mean, there's nothing particularly implausible with Huck Finn running away down the Mississippi River with a slave, but I don't think it happened. I mean, it, it's not like uh, it's impossible, you know, where we're not told Superman buried Jesus or something. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, the plausibility isn't truth, it seems to me. Um, John the Baptist, uh, of course, was taken as, a, as the, Jesus was taken as the resurrection of John the Baptist in, in probably a literal sense by people that didn't understand who he was. It doesn't say, they said, you know, I bet this Jesus guy is probably only, you know, 10 days old, even though he looks older because he was the reincarnation. It, it, the, that's not the point. They, some people had heard of John, heard he died, saw this big deal going on and figured, hey, is this John? Uh, you know, these people didn't, uh, have, it's not like Ed TV that everybody knew the whole life of Jesus. Um, it seems to me that if there was a, a, a historical Jesus, as there may well have been, I do not argue that it's more likely that there wasn't. Uh, if there was, there's certainly no problem in suggesting, as Vreda and Robinson and many other scholars did, and uh, C.H. Dodd, I believe, implies this, that uh, earliest Christians believed that Jesus had died and would shortly return as the Messiah. When time went by and he did not return, they began to messianify if that's a word, to his earthly life and ministry and to say, well, he already came as Messiah. And you know what? He already did return. We just didn't see it because Jesus was seen by primarily or only or originally uh, small groups behind locked doors. Like The thing is that it's by no means uncommon in scholarship to posit an earliest form of Jewish Christian belief that did not involve visions of a resurrection that had already happened. It may have been inferences that as every eye shall see him, as they said at first, that some eyes already did. Which is probably why in, in Mark Jesus is made to say that some standing there will not taste death. 
It was already too late to go with the every eye business. And eventually, as with his messiahship, as Raymond Brown also argues, the, the resurrection was, was retrojected into the past. I wasn't there. I don't know that it happened that way. I don't know that it happened anyway. My point is that there are many possibilities and historical uh, research does not press on to a dogmatic conviction. It doesn't say you should, uh, you should lay down your life on this historical opinion. There are causes on which to live and die, uh, but, uh, but historical opinions can't be uh, dictated that way. And it seems to me it's a, it's a dangerous sin to pretend that they can be. Intellectually, intellectual dishonesty in terms of the most important decision one makes, that of religious faith, will lead to dishonesty down the line, and faith will, will come to uh, be that to which other values are sacrificed. I think one, one must remain with an open mind uh, and an open heart. Thank you for your hearing tonight. I appreciate your coming. I'd like to introduce two, two special guests who are our respondents tonight, and they are each at a microphone, and we'll begin with their questions. The first is on your right, um, this side over here, Father Jordan Lenigan. A Dominican repeat, uh, excuse me, Dominican priest who earned his A.B. at the University of Michigan. Sorry, Dr. Lemke. Um, <laughs> and um, is in the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. The Theological facu Faculty also at the College at the Josephinium here in Columbus. Dr. Lenigan. I want to begin this evening, Dr. Price, by saying I agree with you wholeheartedly on certain, in certain areas. I agree with you wholeheartedly that we can't decide this simply by an appeal to the majority opinion. And that goes through whether it is the Society of Biblical Literature, a meeting of conservative scholars, or the Jesus Seminar in the West Side Institute. Simple appeals to whatever group you happen to get together don't answer the question. It's not up to a vote. And secondly, I agree wholeheartedly with you that a religious experience in and of itself cannot settle the question of an objective truth. Now, putting those two things together, however, I got a couple of problems. And I'm hoping that in the next few minutes, as we sort of give and take, we can get these resolved. All due respect, sounds a little bit like you want to have your cake and eat it too. What I've heard this evening is you say on a number of occasions, there's simply no way to know. And yet, in so many areas, you seem to be quite sure that you do know what didn't happen. It seems to me methodologically that to say something did occur or something did not occur must be said with the same level of confidence. Now, perhaps you will dispute with me from an epistemological perspective, but for you to say it did not happen and that it is impossible to recover any history seems as just as sure a statement as to say that these are overwhelmingly historical documents in the absence of some other outside filter to run the text through, to remove what is historical from what is a theological reflection, it seems to be impossible to make any conclusions. And yet negative conclusions, as I said, are just as strong as positives. How can you say we do not know and yet say things like, we don't know that, you know, where there's a question of its existence, certainly it didn't occur this way. So that's my first question. Do you know or do you not know? I think I'm being inconsistent because I don't claim, in fact, I explicitly repudiated the notion that uh, critical historians can pontificate on what did not happen. My, my uh, statement was that uh, one can judge the uh, resurrection as probably a legend like these other analogous uh, stories that no one denies are legends, and, and that's the that's the only kind of judgment the historian can make. I, so I don't know what did or did not happen. So you agree then that Dr. Craig could be absolutely correct in his his, his analysis of what historically took place? I wouldn't say that. I, I really do think he's t much too cre credulous about narrative as automatically being factual, but he certainly could be right about uh, Jesus rising from the dead. My only point is I do not think. 
that the texts we have are, are historical evidence. I think they're literary creations, so they are not really evidence for the claim. Though Jesus may well have risen from the dead, I just don't think there's any historical reason to be confident of it. So you, you, you don't hold, then, that a literary document could contain historical information? It, it could. It just seems to me, in this case, none of them do. And on what basis can you make such a conclusion? Uh, well, the similarity between these and other legends, but also the great deal of redactional change from one source to another, which I, I believe it sounded like Dr. Craig implicitly admits. There's, there's quite a, a, a number of jumps from Mark's uh, dive. Absolutely, you have absolutely, absolutely correct. Hmm. But would you not hold that there are also consistent similarities between all the accounts? I'm sorry, I didn't... Would you not hold likewise that while there are jumps and, and great changes and certainly are the result of theologizing, that there, are also a, there is a backbone spinal structure that stays consistent? Uh, an apotheosis narrative. Uh, and uh, I think Oni is just out of his mind what he says about Talbert. It's just ludicrous. Uh, and Tom Norris Talbert the first or the only one to say this. It just seems to me, if you have eyes to see, the, these parallels are so close that the burden of proof is on the one that says this one instance of the disciples not being able to find the body uh, is, is uh, literally true. It just seems arbitrary to me. Okay. I, I mean, I, I can't, I guess, disagree with your personal um, feeling on the matter. I just... Looking at the examples you gave, I mean, conversely, I did not find the parallels there, but this, we can go on and on and settle nothing that way. But I do have another question for you. I feel in some ways in sort of great company with a great number of scholars whose names and positions were sort of bantered back and forth this evening. And I noticed your comment about not looking towards authority. I'm sorry? Uh, rejecting authority. Yes. Sir. In this particular, in the, the field, saying, you know, he can muster all of the, the great biblical scholars and researchers, but it's a question of accepting no one's authority. And I guess I just want to, on a personal level, do you reject all authority, all knowledgeable authority, or do you reject simply the authority of biblical scholars? Well, for instance, I uh, do not accept alleged governments, uh, government authorities on foreign policy or, or, or uh, spin doctors or, or news people. It seems to me that one learns to be quite skeptical of all supposed authorities and that Socrates was correct in saying that uh, you, you'd better be able to tell uh, whether someone deserves the reputation for authority they enjoy. So this is by no means restricted to religion to me. Sure, sure. And, okay. Thank you. And on your left, our special guest respondent, the Reverend, Reverend John Allen Watson, who did his B.A. in philosophy at Wheaton College, his B.D. in New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary, and his master's in theology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Since 1970, the, he's been the pastor of the Bethel Presbyterian Church in Columbus, Welcome, Reverend Watson. Thank you very much. And I'm sure I speak for all of us in thanking our two debaters for fulfilling the goal of the Veritas Forum uh, to let truth uh, be heard. And uh, as you have seen the truth, you have spoken the truth, and we appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Price. Uh, if what he is saying is historical proof. Uh, we it, historical proof can never be a necessary can never be a necessary uh, uh, component of belief. Uh, the historical proof simply cannot force us to believe. However, I think I would believe with Dr. Craig that uh, historical proof can certainly be sufficient cause for belief. Never necessary but certainly sufficient. That is my position. I'd agree with you. Well, wonderful. <laughs> now, one further question. Uh, and uh, perhaps Dr. Craig could comment on this, but I'm directing it to Dr. Price. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, as you both have shown us, history, uh, to know what happened in history is not an easy thing. Uh, and scholars uh, almost uh, determine where they're going to come out uh, before they begin by their presuppositions. However, there are facts in history. And uh, two of the most important uh, ripples left behind, it seems to me, by the resurrection of Jesus, for I certainly do believe in the resurrection of Jesus, 
uh, are the transformation and remembering that uh, Christianity arose in the Jewish milieu, the transformation of Passover into the Lord's Supper, where Jesus takes that which was the central element in Israel's faith and says, I don't want you to think any longer about Moses. I want you to think about me. <laughs> I think the impact of that would be roughly equivalent to me standing up before my congregation on a communion Sunday and saying, well, up to this point, you've always thought about Jesus when you had communion, but now I've been your pastor for 30 years, and I want you to think about me every time you have communion, and I want you to do this in memory of me, and I'm changing the significance of what's going on here. I would fully expect my elders to... Uh, rise up in holy horror and bind me with my stole and throw me out the door. Mm. The second thing is Sabbath was one of the most crucial marks of Judaism in the first century. And yet again we find the Sabbath being changed the first day of the week. Uh, Paul mentions this uh, in such a mundane context as the collection for the saints. <laughs> Uh, which immediately, of course, follows 1 Corinthians 15, the exalted story of the resurrection. We have an appeal for funds. Uh, so, again, it's not out of the place to appeal for funds for the uh, Veritas Forum when you're talking about the resurrection. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul talks about bringing a gift on the first day of the week, indicating that at this early time, Christians were already shifting their mark of Judaism from worshiping on the Sabbath, though they probably continue to do that, but shifting to the first. What can account for these historical ripples, the Lord's Supper and the resurrection, excuse me, the Lord's Supper and the Sabbath becoming the first day of the week, if it was not an event of the magnitude of the resurrection? Well, I think the... Um as you mentioned, in all probability, the earliest Jewish Christians did continue to celebrate the Sabbath, though Gentile Christians, especially of the persuasion of Paulinism that, that thought they were not obliged to keep the law, they probably didn't, so we don't hear about it in any, in any of the letters attributed to them. But uh, probably the earliest, or at least somewhere along the line, some early Jewish Christians must have added the Lord's Day, uh, the, the, the first day of the week, on to, to uh, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and then it becomes a question of where did they get that belief, and uh, it's uh, and, and it could be because uh, that's when Jesus rose from the dead, obviously. But uh, it, it, the whole question, as you point out, is a little bit murky. It's hard to know exactly uh, where it came from, and it all reduces to the question of where the the uh, resurrection belief came from. I think it came from the salvation religions of, of uh, the Mediterranean, and uh, that uh, Jesus that that was one of the mythemes brought into it, along with various others from Dionysus, Mithras, etc. I think also with the, the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, in fact, it's interesting that in none of the Gospels does Jesus actually say he is reinterpreting uh, the Passover. That's just the, the inference from the context. Uh, I believe uh, in, in John, it's not a Passover supper. In Matthew and Mark, it's implicitly a Passover supper because of the juxtaposed material next to it. And in Luke, it's the only one where he says, I have desired to eat this pass over with you. But uh, when he then goes on to explain, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, that to me, as Loisi pointed out long ago, sounds like a piece of liturgy already and uh, of a certain kind uh, for to, to picture a Jewish concept here that uh, that that. He, the idea of drinking the blood and eating the flesh of someone even symbolically would be so anathema to, to um, Judaism uh, that it seems to me impossible that this could have arisen in the Jerusalem church. I think it's much more likely that uh, this comes directly from the fertility cults and mystery religions where uh, it makes much more sense for the corn king, as C.S. Lewis called him, to take bread and say, this is my body, which Osiris, the grain god, did. Uh, bread was his body in the sacraments. And what is his blood? Well, wine, the blood of the grape. I mean, that to me bespeaks clearly 
the mythology of a fertility god, a dying and rising savior, and has been read back into earliest Christianity simply because, as a cult legend, it has Jesus at center stage authenticating the, the, the liturgy. But I don't believe that is that early. It must have come uh, in, uh, in Galilean or, or uh, Hellenistic uh, syncretism, in my opinion. I'm conscious of how many of you are at the microphones and how little time we have. So forgive me if I'm sort of abrupt, but we'll just see how many we can get in. Please be clear and be brief. Okay. Dr. Craig, if you believe that empirical historical evidence suggests that the Son of God rose from the dead, still exists today, and who plays, and I quote, an immediate reality in your life, then why didn't you invite Mr. Christ to come join you today and end all dispute as to the, the validity well, wh of his why resurrection? Why didn't I invite whom? Jesus Christ to join you on stage today if he in fact still does exist to end all doubt as to his resurrection. Well, you know, Jesus did say he had other to commitments. his disciples, I shall be with you even unto the ends of the age. So in one sense, I mean, he's promised to be in the midst of us whenever two or three assemble in his name. Now... He's not corporeally present because in his resurrection body, he's exited this space-time universe. But uh, I believe that through his, his spirit, Christ is present. And that, that interior presence enables him to be universally present wherever Christians assemble. Otherwise, he would only be in one geographical locale uh, and everybody else would be excluded. So through the presence of Christ's divine spirit, he, he can be universally present wherever Christians assemble or whatever uh, a Christian is alone. Thank you. On this side. Uh, Dr. Price, I was just, uh, I wanted to ask a question about what you called your theory of, of interpolation. And uh, does this theory include any other groups of scriptures besides the uh, eight that you mentioned? And uh, if, if not, then why would someone just add these eight scriptures and that's it? And if so, um, then do you believe that these verses are not credible because they don't support what you believe in? I missed the second part because of the screaming outside. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the interpolations I think I, I got, but then... Um, do you not believe, if you believe that these are the only eight, script, or only eight verses that have been changed, then do you believe in that only because... They don't support what you believe? No, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not tied to any notion of biblical authority in the sense that uh, I'm going to do or believe what it says to do or, or any book for that matter. It's not like I have to. Though I think that does go on sometimes. For instance, in a lot of Christian feminist discourse, one certainly gets the impression that people are dealing in surgical exegesis. You know, let's let's just clip out the parts we, we don't like because we don't want to be stuck with them. But I, I don't have that agenda. Uh, I do think there are many, many interpolations to the point where probably uh, W.C. von Manen was right in the 19th century saying that all of the epistles are patchworks, that there may be some residue of the original writings of Paul, but that uh, by now they've, they've been so overlaid in the Paulinist school that there's no way to, to absolutely be sure. I think we have a big, as big a problem with the historical Paul as we do with the historical Jesus. Uh, and um, I take the Jesus seminar to task for that. They go along with a kind of uh, critical orthodoxy today that seven of the Pauline epistles are authentic uh, when the same sort of arguments that indicate that they're not could easily be made about the, the remaining ones. And uh, I tend to think that uh, quite a number of things can be identified. For instance, just one example, I uh, know we don't have all night, uh, the, the, in 1 Corinthians, it makes the most sense to me to picture uh, 1 Corinthians 13 as an interpolation in the middle uh, of uh, section chapters 12 and 14 that dealt with speaking in tongues and prophecy as a way of trying to just ditch the whole thing once and for all as dispensationalists now read it. That uh, people tried to say, well, tongues isn't as important as prophecy. Let's, let's try to keep it down there. And then finally, somebody says, oh, let's just nail the thing to the wall. Uh, tongues and all that stuff, forget it. Love only is important. I think you can find a lot of things like that where uh, you can kind of see why different Christians interpret it differently. They're all right. They're just zeroing in on one or another conflicting part of the scripture. It's amazing to read commentaries on the epistles and see how much of them is devoted to harmonization. 
see, now how do we get passage A to agree with passage B? What could Paul have been thinking if this is an answer to this? Well, it's all harmonization, and it seems to me worth a try to see maybe they are just patches that don't quite fit together. So I, I see an epidemic of interpolation. Thank you. Um, Again, clear and brief. Okay. Uh, I've already had the pleasure of speaking on the radio the other day, both Drs. Craig and Price, regarding the work of G.A. Wells, for which Dr. Craig expressed his great disdain. Um, I guess my question is, is, is as follows. There's something astonishing about the New Testament. If you take the way that Christ is portrayed in the Pauline and non-Pauline letters, we get no biographical information at all, no linkage to Pilate, no, um, no, nothing of geography or time. But then we go to the Gospels and there's all this biographical information available. There was a war in Palestine, AD 60 something. Where did they get the information in the Gospels from? And um, how, how have theologians reconciled these two radically different um, pictures of Christ? Because they seem to me, especially with the Pauline and non-Pauline epistles being dated earlier than the Gospels, what does this mean? Should I take... Oh, yeah. um, as I said to you the other day on the radio, I just think it's such a great shame that you have immersed yourself in the writings of this G.A. Wells, who is uh, just a German teacher who has taken up to write on subjects involving the New Testament. And you really need to expand your reading to take in some other things as well. Um, the fact is that the epistles are not devoid of historical references to Jesus. There was an excellent article in New Testament Studies a few years back by Dale Allison on this very point. And he, he calls Paul's letters the fifth gospel because in them you get... Uh, uh, definite illusion, allusions and even quotations of the teachings of Jesus. We see uh, Paul handing on traditions like the tradition of the Last Supper. And what's significant, Allison points out, is that all we're seeing in these letters of Paul is just the tip of the iceberg because they're just accidental allusions that Paul is making in many cases to these things. For example, if it hadn't been for the fact that the Corinthian church was abusing the Lord's Supper and getting drunk, we wouldn't have any references in the Pauline epistles to the Lord's Supper. And many New Testament scholars would in that case have undoubtedly said, aha, Pauline communities did not celebrate the Lord's Supper. But we have this little passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul cites the Lord's Supper tradition. And what's significant about that is that he says this occurred on the night that the Lord was betrayed which shows that he knew the context of the traditions that he delivered. It shows he's aware of the broader passion story of Jesus. So I think that there's every reason to believe that Paul was fully familiar with this. Recall that Luke was probably a traveling companion of Paul. I, I think that the author of Luke Acts was, in fact, uh, a, a, a traveling companion of Paul on his missionary journeys. He went back to Jerusalem with Paul. So I think Paul was fully informed uh, about these things. And I think that it's simply wrong to suggest that somehow Paul was unfamiliar with this historical information or unconcerned with it. The last thing I just say briefly is that I think uh, there's very good and persuasive reasons to think that several of the Gospels were written prior to the Jewish War. Uh, that began in AD 66, uh, and uh, therefore are uh, quite close to the original events themselves. Well, thank you for your response, and I'll check out the book you recommend, actually, the Franz book. Thanks. On the left. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Price, I'm Paul Lagno from Columbus, Ohio, and um, it seems to me that in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was only dogmatic on one fact. He says, I will know nothing among you, brethren, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you personally believe that Jesus Christ was crucified and died for your sins? And if so, based on that fact, do you believe that you will have a resurrection sometime in the future? Well, I uh, am a former evangelical Christian and uh, for, for 12 years, in which time I witnessed to people and and so forth, but I have come over the years not to uh, accept the doctrine of the atonement, which strikes me as incoherent and immoral. I, I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I've come to find it not only unbelievable so much, well, not uh, unbelievable so much as, as objectionable and incoherent, 
Uh, I, so I, I don't see it that way. I, I know how this is going to sound, but uh, I, I would not even say that Funk is correct about the crucifixion of Jesus being the one unalterable rock of historicity, because there are a number of contemporary Greco-Roman novels in which uh, the, the hero is condemned to the cross, but then escapes at the last minute. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that even this may be a novelistic device. Again, I'm not saying it probably is, but uh, I just don't know. I think the whole thing is so shrouded in legend that uh, I, I do not uh, feel that we can know short of some discovery that's not been made yet. And as for my own po post-mortem fate, now we see in the glass darkly. I, I will be surprised if there's anything after death. Uh, and uh, if there's not, it's okay by me. Life is really great right here. Thank you. And on this side, could Dr. Dr. Yamauchi make his way a little bit more to the front, please? Thanks. And question from the right. Uh, this is for Dr. Craig. Yes. Um, in your defense, you, were, you referred specifically, almost exclusively, I think, to the Bible um, for all of your defense. And I, I think to do this, you have to look at the credibility of the people who wrote the Bible and see whether it is undeniable fact that they must have been telling the truth. And in response to this issue, you did say that why would these people have been willing to die for what they believed in? Um, because it would have been such an abhorrent idea to the Jews at the time that he would have risen from the dead. Um, I think throughout history we have plenty of evidence of people who have been willing to die for things which have been obviously wrong and insane to believe. In fact, if we look at the Waco massacre or the Heaven's Gate cult, I know the situation was different and people might be offended by drawing a comparison, but simply basing it on the fact that these people died for it seems suspect. What? Good question. Let me explain my argument. Certainly, many, many people have been willing to die for a falsehood. But in every case, they thought it was the truth. Now, in this case, we're asked to believe that these original disciples, like Peter, and, and Jesus' own younger brother, James, that Paul spoke with firsthand and talks about in 1 Corinthians and in Galatians, that these guys honestly came to believe Jesus is risen from the dead and were ready to go out and die for that because they had heard stories about Hercules and Romulus. And I just find that utterly fantastic to believe. I mean, most of us have brothers. What would it take to make you believe that your brother is the Lord so that you would be willing to die for that belief? Um, I just can't imagine what that would be, apart from something like what Paul says, then he appeared to James. So my argument here is not that because someone is sincere, therefore their belief is true. That, that's obviously wrong. But what I'm suggesting is that uh, you cannot write off the belief of these earliest disciples by saying that it had its origins in Greco-Roman mythology. Uh, that you've got to explain what sort of transformative experience occurred that made these early Jewish believers come to believe something so outlandish and, and absurd as that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. And it seems to me that the best explanation of that is that they were telling the truth. Uh, he had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Yamauchi is a, a guest respondent questioner and a historian and scholar, uh, professor of history at Miami University. Yes. I'd like to address the issue of the Jesus Seminar, which has been mentioned several times, and I understand that Dr. Price doesn't agree with all the uh, decisions made by the Jesus Seminar. But the Jesus Seminar has published two rather elaborately publicized books. The first one, Five Gospels which doubted whether 85% of the sayings of Jesus are authentic, and a more recent one, which has received rather less publicity, the Acts of Jesus, which questions whether 85% of the uh, Acts, for example, the Passion narrative, uh, are authentic. For example, the Jesus Seminar does not believe in the tradition of Joseph from Arimathea, uh, the tomb story, the details of the crucifixion. They conclude that that narrative was fabricated by Mark on the basis of Psalm 22. And I see very heavily the influence of Burton Mack and his 
no, <coughs> a novel a revolutionary idea that the only authentic source for the early Jesus was the same source called by the Germans Quella or Q for short, the 200 verses which are common to Matthew and Luke, and not just Q as we have it now, but rather the earliest freedom of Q. At the same time, I also note that James Robinson, a fellow colleague at Claremont of Burton Mac, severely criticizes his use of Q and doubts very much the cynic portrayal of Jesus, which then led the Jesus Seminar to accept only aphoristic statements and parables as authentic. So that's my first statement and question uh, to <coughs> the speakers. Secondly, Dominic Crossan, with whom uh, Dr. Craig has debated, has said famously, those who know about Jesus did not, I mean, those who knew about the details of the crucifixion and burial did not care, and I'm paraphrasing him, and those who cared about those details did not know. Yet the Jesus Seminar allows the fact that there were women at the cross, and Dominic Cross, and at least, except First Corinthians 15, so I'd like either of you to comment. Well, I'd just like to say first what a thrill and delight it is to, to hear from you and to see you here, sir. I've enjoyed your books for many years, and I'd like to see more of them. Uh, I uh, do uh, find the Jesus Seminar to be inconsistent on a number of things because there is a pretty overt theological agenda that uh, the, the group as a whole and some of its members not all have to reform and rejuvenate Christianity with a sketch of Jesus as the figurehead, which even they admit may not be the real historical Jesus. One gets conflicting signals from them. And uh, to say that the women disciples were there to the last seems to me obviously a reflection of the feminist convictions of that group, which I share, but I don't want them to dictate my research. Uh, and uh, whereas the, the skepticism on the other costs them nothing ideal logically and and uh, I agree there it does seem to me to be very significant that the mark and crucifixion account seems so much like psalm 22 and no appeal is made to psalm 22 as a as as the prophecy this fulfills I really do see that as a as a problem for the historicity of it with uh, with regard to to Mac and Robinson on Q, I was there once when uh, Robinson gave a pretty scathing critique of what uh, Leif Vaga and, and some others have done with the stratigraphy of Q, and uh, because they they make kind of silly uh, assertions on the basis of it that, that don't even follow from their 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 own uh, reckoning of it, but. Uh, Robinson, I don't think, has moved from the kind of thing he says in way back in the book with Kester, the trajectories from early Christianity, where he really started the ball rolling on that, saying that a sayings collection denotes a different kind of, of Christian sect that would have compiled it, someone for whom Jesus must have been paramountly a sage, though not necessarily a cynic sage. And uh, there are huge questions about that with cynicism even known in the area. And there are pretty good arguments that it was, but there are pretty good arguments that it wasn't. And and you can never be sure, but I think sometimes Crossan especially is a little too sure of things and that his, uh, his sketch of Jesus it makes Jesus a function of the categories he uses to analyze the Gospels. It's just Jesus is a distillation of the tools he uses, and, and I just I don't have much agreement with him. Thank you, Dr. Yamachi. It's good to see you back here. Next. Um, Dr. Craig, as the previous questioner pointed out, uh, you have made your entire basis of your arguments upon the quotation of biblical documents. And obviously, there have been some issues raised as to not only the veracity of those documents, but also their origin, as Dr. Price has some issues with who wrote what might have been patched together. So I would think from your side, the easiest way to sidestep that whole messy issue would be to give some sources from outside the Bible to show your case. I mean, of course, all those 500 people who witnessed the resurrection weren't all illiterate, were they? Some of them might have left records. So what are the non-biblical sources that might establish some of the facts? I think that this question uh, portray, or, uh, evinces a very common misunderstanding among students that I find uh, when I speak on university campuses. It, it, it's the idea that the New Testament is a sort of single book and that... Uh, 
And that what we've got to really find is evidence outside of this book, because anything in this book isn't real evidence. What we need is extra biblical evidence. And that's why I emphasized at the beginning of my talk, I'm not treating the New Testament as a book, but as what it originally was, just a bunch of separate documents written in the Greek language, uh, letters, gospels, acts, uh, coming down out of the first century. The church later assembled these documents under one cover. And when they did so, they took the documents that were the uh, earliest and closest to the apostolic uh, band. So that by the very nature of the case, the primary sources were all included in the New Testament. And the secondary, later derivative sources were left out. So to ask for evidence outside the New Testament is the only acceptable evidence is to say we're going to ignore all of the primary sources and instead we're only going to look at the derivative secondary sources, which is crazy historical methodology. What, what you've got to do is look at all of the sources. Now, when you do that, the, the fact of the matter is that there is a paucity of literature from the first century. There just isn't very much. I mean, besides Josephus, what have you got? Uh, and, and Josephus does refer to Jesus on a couple of occasions, as well as John the Baptist and Pilate and Annas and Caiaphas and the rest of this colorful story. So, um, you know, the degree to which we do have extra biblical literature, it does confirm what the New Testament says. But it, we don't learn a whole lot new from it. So the real question has got to be, how reliable are these documents? And, and that's going to be the bottom line that, that you've got to ask. It doesn't depend upon who they're written by. And nothing that I said tonight uh, asked you to accept the received authorship of any of these materials. Rather, I argued on the basis of things like their early date, the traditions that were uh, involved there. The, I did argue for the authenticity of 1 Corinthians 15, but there, as I say, I have everybody in New Testament scholarship on my side on that point. So I don't think I'm asking you to believe things that are uh, in any way question-begging. Thank you for your response. I have kind of a crazy idea, and um, it's about 10 after 10, and I know we've been here for a while and, and uh, are, are eager to stay, I think, and ask some questions, but I wonder if we could hear a few questions at a time for, for each side and uh, allow each speaker one last remark trying to encompass those questions. Is that asking too sure. much? That's a that? good idea. Okay. So uh, let's see, where do, where do we leave off there? Okay. Could, could you all state your questions as briefly as you can? And if someone, if it's your question has then already been asked, maybe step out of line. My question is kind of a carries over from the previous question, and it's directed at uh, Dr. Price. Um, I actually was going to ask you about the extra biblical uh, sources in terms of seeking a belief in a historical Christ, and I was going to ask you about Josephus as well as Cornelius Tacitus, who makes a clear reference to the execution of Christ in his work. What, um, how do you feel about the historicity of Christ as a person and the historicity of his death in light not just of what we've talked about tonight in the Bible, but the extra biblical sources? Great. And then the next question? Dr. Price, Dr. Craig made several corrections to the statements that you made. First one being that uh, we do have the 200 AD document of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Second being that uh, one of the church fathers, Ignatius, did mention... Uh, verses 8 and 9 of the 1st Corinthians 15 uh, and third being that you used uh, one of the passages from mythology as a proof uh, presupposing that it was predating um, the gospel accounts yet Dr. Craig showed that that passage was written in response uh, to Christian documents and you had several occasions where you could have responded to those and you didn't. And uh, if we do find out tonight that those are mistakes in your research, what reasons do we have to believe that anything else that you've said tonight, in all due respect, carries any value or significance? Thanks. Thanks. Next. Uh, my question has to do with um, what Dr. Craig uh, spoke on in his opening argument. It's directed towards Dr. Price, though. 
Uh, he gave four reasons why he believed that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was um, reasonable. Uh, the, honorable, the honorable burial, empty tomb, post-mortem post appearances, and the change in the disciples' faith. Do you believe um, that any, any of these are true? Um, if you do, why? If you don't, why? Okay. Dr. Price, if, uh, if indeed faith is less than uh, legitimate or valid because it is based uh, perhaps on subjective feelings as you said at the beginning um, and if indeed those feelings are less than valid and legitimate in themselves what is it that you, you base your um, mentions of sin dishonesty and uh, your, your zealous drive to seek the truth hmm. thank you yeah, it, it, it seemed that the argument or the question at the beginning of the evening was, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Dr. Craig clearly tried to present a case. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. He gave at least four lines of evidence. I didn't hear the refutation of them. It seems that you would argue, no, Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. But what I heard was, maybe, I don't think so, but probably not. Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, what convinces you, if, if in fact you're convinced he did not rise from the dead, what's the line of evidence that you gave that would convince us that Jesus did not rise from the dead? And what is the refutation for the four main lines of evidence that he presented clearly and you had 45 minutes to respond to and didn't make your case? Thank you. My question concerns your, your parallel between Apollonius and the story of Doubting Thomas. Um, and you say there are a number of parallels, but aren't there a number of really stark differences. For instance, Thomas did not expect to see Jesus, whereas Apollonius' disciple seemed to expect that. And the Apollonius' disciple saw a vision, whereas Thomas was in the presence of disciples who saw a physical body appear to him, the physical body of Jesus. Um, when you were speaking of the fact that the women that were witnesses to the empty, open tomb um, and the fact that they would have been accepted in that culture, even if the culture that they had come from was a pagan society and um, had been more open to women's opinions, the opinions that the woman had given were second-guessed by all of the men in these situations, um, not only with the tomb in uh, Luke uh, chapter 4, but also in John chapter 23, when the woman at the well, um, Jesus foretells all of her life to her, and then she goes and tells her city or town, um, as Jesus asks her to, and the men have to come back and double check and make sure that what she's saying is true. These women were not accepted as true witnesses, despite the fact that this culture I mean, even if it was a pagan society, they still double-check the women. And also, in uh, reading the book, Ex of Jesus, I was just wondering, since you stated that you doubt the historicity of um, any literary document, uh, did you vote for all black, or, you know, did you overstep the bounds of colors in, in the choices of anything being historically accurate, since you did not pose Josephus or Irain anybody else as um, also historically acceptable. Mm -hmm. Dr. Price, uh, during your eight-minute counter-rebuttal, you made a statement referring to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, where Jesus of Nazareth is referred to exalted as, as being exalted. Um, something that crossed my mind that I'd be interested to hear your take on was, uh, was how could a shamefully crucified leader of a very small minority possibly be referred to exalt to uh, possibly be referred to as exalted if he were still dead unless he had resurrected I was just uh, curious dr. Price uh, with your disinclination to believe in the resurrection upon uh, what authority uh, you lead your home group that's all I'm sorry on what authority upon what authority do you lead your home group when you have a disinclination to believe in the resurrection on what authority do I lead that home group? Is when there's a disinclination, yes. Uh -huh. you, have, you have a church or a group in your home, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Last question. Uh, Mr. Price, uh, in all of your arguments that I've heard this evening, um, you've pretty much discounted a, a lot of New Testament authority uh, 
people, being a New Testament authority yourself, uh, and you're asking us to believe uh, that we have to accept and consider all possibilities, what if you're wrong? And he's right. What then? Okay. I think I can actually cram these in. Uh, <coughs> see, uh, for one thing, uh, a few of them uh, real quick, all excellent questions. Uh, if, uh, if I am wrong, uh, what I think uh, somebody asked Clarence Darrow this. He was much interested in religion, uh, but an agnostic. And they said, what if you, you know, the whole Christian thing is right, and, and you, you, find, you get to the pearly gates and find out. He, he'd, he said, well, I'd say, gentlemen, I was mistaken. Yeah, and, and you have to ask then, well, is God going to be a peevish theology professor? That's, that's too bad, you bastard. You're going to fry. Uh, if that is the reaction of God, I don't think that's a God worthy of worship, so I'm not too worried. I think if I seek the truth as well as I can uh, and uh, with as, as clean a conscience as I can, I, I'm not going to worry. I mean, I'm going to hell in somebody's dogma anyway, right? The Muslims, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I might as well call them as I see them. Uh, my authority in preaching uh, is, is not an authority. I take the approach, uh, uh, I understand Socrates to have taken the, the, the midwife approach. I pose questions and perspectives, and I seek uh, to uh, get people to think about them, and I speak for about 20 minutes and then have a couple of hours of discussion with my tiny little group where, where all viewpoints are heard. So I do not have, I do not seek or claim an authority to tell somebody a truth that they must accept because I say it. I did vote all black on historical issues in the Gospels of the Jesus Seminar uh, as to how uh, a slain Jewish leader could be uh, thought to be exalted uh, up to the right hand of God without a resurrection. Well, uh, in Second Maccabees, we're told that uh, Judah Maccabee had a vision of Onias III, the priest slain by the agents of Antiochus Epiphanes, and that for his righteousness he had been exalted uh, to serve as a mediator before the throne of God in heaven along with Jeremiah for his people. Uh, they didn't believe Onias had been resurrected, and it seems to me many early Christians may have believed the same thing about Jesus before they adopted the belief that he had already been resurrected, just as, as many of Rabbi Schneerson's followers today think he will be resurrected, and some are beginning to think that perhaps he has. Uh, women as witnesses. Uh, my point was not that, yes, they were recognized as witnesses after all, though I have heard some researchers say that there may be some basis to say that. I'm not competent to judge. My point is simply that uh, the uh, empty tomb stories come from a different quarter. They don't, uh, they're not offered as evidence for the resurrection. They're deposits, rather, of a kind of women's lamentation literature, such as is mentioned by Ezekiel, the women who mourned for the dying and rising God, Tammuz, in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So they're not uh, they're not offered as, as proof of anything. Um, the uh, the uh, the doubting Thomas thing in Apollonius of Tyana. It strikes me that uh, if you understand what an ideal type is in any field of study, it's a kind of a, a broad dictionary definition that gathers the similarities that one, that one usually finds in particular examples. You, you find a, a textbook picture of a human being as opposed to an ape. Uh, you're not going to find any human that looks exactly like that. But if you see two or three people together with a head, two legs, two arms, one of them has red hair, one of them has black hair, he's like, what, human beings? They're nothing alike. You have to, I mean, the whole thing assumes that there are differences. The point is, it seems to me the similarities are quite striking. If this disciple had a vision in a waking dream of Apollonius, it seems to me uh, just a variation on the, the, uh, the acceptable range of variants uh, for uh, one where they think they're seeing a vision of Jesus, but he's really there. There's another Apollonius story where they think he's raised from the dead because he appears in a locked room, but he isn't. He's just teleported like Philip does from, uh, from Ethiopia to Azotus or whatever it is in, in the book of Acts. So it seems to me that, uh, that one uh, seizes on the irrelevant differences to avoid the force of the similarities. Speaking of Apollonius, I do not recall uh, th this business that, uh, that uh, Philostratus was commissioned to write a counterblast to the Gospels. I don't think even Eusebius says that in his rejoinder to the life of Apollonius by Philostratus. Uh, what I do remember is that uh, the empress asked him to, or commissioned him to write uh, the thing to rehabilitate his reputation because Apollonius was widely considered to be a wizard and a sorcerer just as Jesus was among pagans.
pagans who didn't believe in him. And so he, he wrote this life of a philosopher to, to uh, you know, as, as an apologetic, but I, I don't know that there's any reason to think it was a counterblast to Christianity. And, the, and uh, let's see, the date of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9, uh, I'm not trying to say that uh, this was interpolated in the 5th century or something. I'm trying to say that uh, it's after the time of Paul. You've got several decades before anybody quotes it or any manuscripts are found. It, it doesn't require a huge amount of time for that, so you know, I, I don't have a problem with that. The, uh, the extra biblical references and so on, I, I tend to uh, agree with, uh, with Dr. Craig that given what, well, that, that there, you do have to take seriously the New Testament evidence. I just find it to be wanting historically when I do. But I do not think that, the, that it's some shocking thing to find little to nothing in ex biblical sources, because if, if the Gospels are true in every respect historically, what would uh, your pagan newspaper editor, so to speak, have known? Who would have said, oh, there's another faith healer, an exorcist, or there are a dime a dozen? You wouldn't expect to find much about Jesus, so that has never struck me as a powerful argument. Uh, Tacitus uh, does refer to the the, crucif the execution of Christus under the prefect of Pontius Pilate. Uh, that, I don't think, is, is really uh, important evidence because it simply reflects what everyone knew Christians believed. It's interesting he calls him Jesus, not Jesus, but, but Christus. It implies he simply heard Christian preaching. So, uh, I, and same thing with, uh, with the... Uh, Pliny, uh, the younger letter uh, to, to Trajan. Yeah, we, we knew Christians believed in Christ. That, that's no big deal. The Josephus thing has been rewritten to some degree, but no one knows how much because there are different versions of it in Arabic, Slavonic, and Greek. And uh, apparently some of it has been added since Origen read a copy of it in the second century that we don't have. But I think it is likely Josephus did refer to Jesus. And that would be... Uh, uh, that would be uh, evidence on the, the scale of a historical Jesus. I'm not trying to say it's all or nothing. It just seems to me on balance that the, uh, the predominantly legendary cast of the Jesus material outweighs the other, but it, it's not absolutely clear. Uh, I, of course, admit I could be wrong. In fact, I'm not making a dogmatic assertion on any question. My point is that I'm trying to approach it in terms of historical methodology. Uh, I'm not trying to make uh, dogmatic theological statements, and therefore uh, the what I base my urge uh, to, to intellectual honesty on and so forth, it's simply a matter of consistency. Uh, I don't know that one can prove there's an absolute categorical imperative written in stone that one ought to, to uh, value love, truth, etc. It just seems to me those are good things to value, and as long as we can agree on that, that truth is good, I feel comfortable urging everyone to intellectual honesty. I couldn't prove to some Nazi that it's not a good idea to tell the truth and to love people, but I think we all agree on that. Um, let's see, uh, what, uh, about these, these points that I've allegedly neglected, I've tried to say again and again, uh, there, there is no fact imply, uh, there's no fact necessitated by the story that a man named Joseph uh, saw out of the burial of Jesus. Uh, I mean, it's stated in a narrative source which seems everywhere else to be filled with marbles and so forth, or historical difficulties, there are, and anachronisms, there are various problems with it. It just seems to me that, sure, a man named Joseph of Arimathea could have buried Jesus, but uh, you know there's no particular reason to think so because of the quality of the source. The same thing with the empty tomb thing. Uh, if these, if it's to be seen as one more apotheosis story, where the the clue is no one can find the body, you just don't have to raise the questions of yeah, what did they do with the body? It's a myth. But but let's assume that uh, since nobody seems to want to hear that, let's assume there really was a, a, a burial of Jesus and that uh, they uh, that they. Uh, did not produce the body to expose the hoax. Well, look, what does the book of Acts say? They waited seven weeks after the death of Jesus to proclaim uh, the, the resurrection. How, what are you going to do? Identify a rotting pile of flesh by dental records? Hey, it's Jesus. Take a whiff. You know, that, that's impossible. It's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, as for the, the rabbi saying, oh, he stole the body. Well, in a third century source, a rabbi says, you say he rose from the dead. Oh, okay, he rose from the dead. Satan raised him, though. You see, the style of argumentation is to say, I'll go you one better. The tomb was empty? Great. 
But that's just because they stole the body. It doesn't presuppose that they knew what had happened or didn't happen. It's just tit-for-tat polemics. Uh, so I don't think you have to take the empty tomb thing too seriously. Uh, the, the appearances, people have visions of Jesus all the time, as I admit. Uh, it just seems to me that these things are deposits of redactional and legendary material so that I do not see the gospel texts as good evidence for, for appearances that someone had. Maybe they did see the risen Jesus. Maybe Oral Roberts saw him. I, I don't have any. It's just that it doesn't have much veridical value. And finally, what could have transformed them? Again, we do not know that, and Josephus tells us about the martyrdom of James, doesn't ever mention the resurrection of Jesus. He says, why do you ask me concerning the Son of Man? And they split his skull open. Unfortunately, he doesn't say, why do you ask me concerning the death and resurrection on the third day? We don't know that that was on the agenda. And many scholars think that there was early non-resurrection, even non-messianic belief in Jesus. Now, let's assume that there were disciples who followed Jesus and were grossly disappointed and taken aback and disillusioned when he died. Can we explain the ongoing of the movement? Of course we can. Look at the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the movement of Sabbatite Sabi, and countless other uh, movements that have had gross disappointments. In the case of the Sabatian movement in the 17th century, the Messiah apostatized. He was put on the spot. You will be executed or adopt Islam. What was his reaction? Allah Akbar. I mean, if you think the crucifixion of the Messiah is bad, how about the apostasy of the Messiah? Did, did the movement collapse? No. They suddenly said, oh, well, uh, he didn't really apostatize. It was just a phantom. Or he did, but it was an atoning apostasy so that he could uh, plumb the depths of sin for us so that we wouldn't have to. And, oh, and it was prophesied, too. Do we forget to tell you that? And so on and so forth. It's, it's the same kind of for cognitive dissonance reduction strategy. It, 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 many people will fall away, like the two guys going back to Emmaus. That's psychologically plausible. Well, we hoped he was the Messiah. But, but many others will say, hey, uh-uh, no way. I'm not going to face that ridicule. Come hell or high water. He was the Messiah. I went to Berkeley once and saw, uh, in about uh, 1979, a table set up on the campus for Guru Maharaji. And I said, hey, wait a second, didn't this kid's mom kick him off the throne of the universe for marrying his secretary? Don't they know that? And my friend said, uh, well, uh, they just think it's a media hoax. The Rastafarians, they believe Haile Selassie's still alive. We know he isn't, but they say it's a media hoax. There were people that wanted Jim and Tammy Baker back. There were people that didn't want Clinton impeached. I mean, whatever you say, whatever you prove, some people are not going to budge. And so uh, it seems to me it's, it's, it's naive to, to even seek some big uh, mysterious explanation. And one last thing, to invoke a miracle as an explanation. That's trying to explain X by double X. You know, we don't understand what happened here, so let's say uh, a miracle did it, yeah. That's like saying we don't know who built the pyramid, so it must have been uh, UFOs. Oh, well, thanks, we got that one settled. You know, well, anyway. Thanks, Dr. Perry. Okay. Final comments. Your questions, please. Very clear, if you could, right up to the microphone. Okay, sorry. I have an observation that I'd like Dr. Craig to comment on. It seems that for any claim of reality made, a proportional amount of evidence would be needed to support the claim. For instance, if I claim that I hot-rotted with Elvis in a UFO last night, I would be required to supply an extraordinary amount of evidence to support this, and I would be just one eyewitness. You make an extraordinary claim, too, that Jesus died and resurrected, but you only offer four or five individual accounts or sources, that is, the Gospels and Acts, that are actually about 2,000 years old. Uh, I'd just like to address the fact that uh, it seems that we've been arguing about things that have happened after the event, like we're citing sources that happened 200 years, and then we're de debating about how valid those are, and we can see the exponential extrapolation of that right now, because we've got branches of religions that have come off of this. But I'd just like to ask a question, uh, like especially to Mr. Craig, about the fact, like, documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls and things that I've heard of, I don't know a lot about them, but things that told what would happen before they happened, and they're, you know, carbon dated. They, they're, they happened before, they're written before the actual events. And then the fact that they were documented that they did happen. What, like, what kind of probability do you have a number, like, a statistic that that's possible? Or is, is that reasonable? And if it is, 
Is that, can we use that as an explanation? And if it's not, then how can we have all this documentation from before the time of something that happened that then happened, but then we can just say that all oh, that doesn't work because it's not probable. Like, do you have a number of uh, probability of, of that fact? So. Uh, for uh, Dr. Price, please. Um, oh, I don't have a question for Dr. Craig. Am I on the Dr. Craig side of the room? Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I wish I could have had a chance to respond to many of those questions that Dr. Price was able to answer, uh, because I wish those issues had come up in the context of the debate so that I could have uh, given my response. Um, but in any case, this first question concerning extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This sounds so commonsensical, and it's become a sort of watchword among people in the free thought movement who want to debunk miracle claims. But in fact, this is demonstrably false, the idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. There's a whole literature among probability theorists from Condorcet in the uh, 1700s to John Stuart Mill in the 1800s discussing what type of evidence is required to establish extraordinarily improbable events. And it was uh, dis realized by probability theorists that you can't say that extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily improbable events require extraordinary evidence, because otherwise we would never believe, say, a news report on the news last night about someone's winning a lottery because that is an extraordinarily improbable event, and yet we don't require extraordinary evidence for that. Rather, probability theorists realize that what you also need to ask is what is the probability that the evidence would be as it is if the event were not to take place? In other words, it's not simply the probability of the resurrection of Jesus, given the background information that needs to be assessed, you need to assess also what is the probability that there would be the evidence of the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the disciples' faith if this event called the resurrection had not taken place. And I think that's extraordinarily improbable. That is, in effect, to say what other explanations of, the of these, these three facts are there apart from the resurrection. And as I say, there just isn't any probability for any of those. And that would offset any intrinsic improbability in the resurrection hypothesis. But the second thing that needs to be said is I don't think the resurrection hypothesis is improbable. What is improbable is the hypothesis that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. That's more improbable than anything. But that's not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I don't see anything improbable about that, especially if you have good reasons for believing the existence of God. Now, with respect to the second question, the sources I was quoting aren't 200 years later. I mean, part of the burden of my argument was to show that many of these sources and traditions go back to within five, seven years after the crucifixion of Jesus, so that it is fanciful to write these off as being myths and legends, which typically take generations or even centuries to accrue. Uh, and as for the prophecies contained in books written prior to the New Testament, I must confess that's just simply an area that I'm not a specialist in and therefore uh, have no sort of authoritative opinion to, to offer on these things. But uh, I would just encourage you, if you found the debate tonight interesting, uh, to begin to read in, in this area. I think there's fascinating literature out there today, and uh, I'm sure that uh, if you're a Christian, you'll find this to be confirmatory of your faith. Uh, I am, I'm shocked as I have interacted with skeptical scholars on the resurrection, how over and over again I find these scholars driven to adopt extremist positions in order to explain away the evidence. Uh, so that I think as, as a Christian, you will find yourself confirmed by, in, your, in your faith by reading this sort of material. If you're a non-Christian, I hope that you'll find yourself challenged by this and that you'll ask yourself honestly, could this really be true? Could there really be a God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ who was sent uh, to free me from sin and to give me a personal relationship with God?